The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and let me set the scene for this teardown for you. Imagine it's 1978. You've just finished after a hard day's work at Toys R Us. You jump in your brand new Mark III Ford Capri to head home. You're getting ready to go and meet your friends at the cinema to see the brand new film Superman the Movie. All of a sudden you realise you're going to miss the opening episode of season 2 of Chips, your favourite TV programme. So what do you do? What any self-respecting person does. You stick a VC60 in the VCR to record it. A what? Now, this seems really obvious, but this isn't your normal VHS. Um, obviously, the big headline battle of the, the videotape wars was VHS versus Betamax. I'd never even heard of a VC60. Apparently, Philips had their own cartridge style recording medium, and I've got a couple here. Now, I, whoever I got hold of these from was methodical and concise and I absolutely love it. Uh, these particular ones each contain a video from 1984, uh, episodes of Auto Man, and they've got the clippings from the TV guide and uh, spines are marked and they're just fantastic. Love it. Uh, each video is kind of like an 8-track, uh, they sort of self-spool onto themselves. Uh, they have this weird thing in the bottom to seemingly break them to make sure they don't unspool in the box. Uh, and you've got your normal sort of releases, read and write mechanisms. Uh, and the other one I've got is actually slightly damaged. And you can see it pops open straight away. Uh, it's also got this section on the side. Uh, I'm not quite fathomed why you've got two accesses to the media yet, but we'll work that out, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's a shame that's broken. It just seems to be that clip up there is just not biting properly. So the Philips tape in the VC60 format um, actually hails from about 1972. Um, however, in 1978, they released... Bear with me here. <sighs> the 16 kilogram or uh, 32 pound video cassette recorder N1700, which is the first one to feature long play. This is apparently a slight upgrade to the N1500, which had come out the year before. Looks very, very similar, but has a better delay timer. There was also an N1702, which had an extra counter on the timer as well. And lots of variations about this time. But this, not surprisingly, doesn't work. Built like a tank, looks gorgeous. Cosmetically, it's in very good condition, considering how old it is. And it's a technology which doesn't seem to have persisted. So, shocking, I know, but it's got on the front eight channel selectors. I think that's even generous, uh, certainly in the UK at that time. I'm not sure when Channel 4 launched, but it's about that time, I think. You've got the tuning controls, all analogue, all manual, all amazing. Um, you've got a delay recorder, your playback controls. Tracking, which is also all completely manual, and power. Timer. And that's about it. The N1702 at least came with a tuning assist where you could flick a little switch and it would put out a, like a test card onto the uh, antenna output so you could tell when you were tuning it. This, if I ever get this working again, and I do intend to, I've no idea how I'm going to tune it. I mean, I'm glad I've got a couple of tapes, but I, it could still prove a challenge. I might not know it's working even when it is. Um, the eject button doesn't work. I think that's probably, I mean, obviously I haven't powered this up, um, but I think this is probably an interlock, so it's an electronic release as opposed to a mechanical release, because I think this is going to have to spool the tape back into the cassette before it'll eject, otherwise you'd ruin the tape every time you pressed eject. On the back, you have to excuse me, I won't be lifting this more than I have to. 
um, you've got antenna in, antenna out, and power. And that's it. On the bottom, we've got this enormous inspection panel here. And I think this is going to reveal a lot, if not all, of why I think this doesn't work. This was apparently in storage at a museum which went bust and had to get rid of its stuff. I bought it through a reclaim type organisation. They had not checked it, they sold it as spares or a prop not working. I'd love to see it working again, I've got a couple of tapes. It'd be great to see an archive of just that little slice of history when this was in use. And it's such a comparatively rare thing, it'd just be great to play with I think. Oh, I was kind of hoping we'd get a manufactured date on this already somewhere. Look at the, just everything about this is just massive chunks of metal and big heady engineering. For 1977, I can't see an integrated circuit anywhere. You've got all these, a motherboard with lots of different modules on board, which is amazing for serviceability. Now that, that's just awesome. So we've got a Three big RF cages here. Obviously, that one I can already see goes to the RF out. So this is probably some video processing from the video player. And I'm gonna guess that's the video in, or the antenna in. So you can sort of make up, start to see how that functions together. And all these little daughter boards have different functions. And if I pull these out, you can see they've just got PCB edge connectors and they're all discrete components. This particular one is labeled up as chroma filter. It's got a part number, a service code, and a verbal description of what it does. And it's all made up by discrete components, which is awesome because in theory, anything on here should be maintainable. I mean, even replacing components on here is within my, my soldering ability, just. So let's hope it does work, but if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. I suspect debugging and understanding it is going to be the bigger challenge here. Oh, and there are actually ICs in here. TDA2710 and a TDA2720. I wonder what they are. We'll give those a little look later. Oh, uh, more video signal control. Got a couple of questionable looking traces on here. They look like they didn't get a whole load of solder flow on them. Uh, all the traces are actually exposed copper with flow solder over it or wave solder over it. So there's a couple here that are just notably a different colour. They look like they could do with reflowing. Oh, oh nice. That's actually on a hinge, a spring-loaded hinge to hold it up. So for what I'm doing, I didn't, I will have still needed to have unfolded those bits of metal, but. If you are just servicing and maintaining this, you can just lift the whole thing up, having removed this little plastic uh, self-sealing uh, rivet. You find those on cars as well. So what are these? Two big switches which play and record. And you can see how that mechanism these two paddles interface with these two switches. I'm sure a lot of people know that you had to press play and record, but you know, I, I'm sure there are a lot of people that have never had the fortune of playing with a tape recorder of any sign, because you don't have to do that with anything else these days, do you? But yeah, to make this record, you have to press play and record, otherwise it won't work. So again, on the underside of this, um, servo board. We've still got more of these little modules. Uh, more ICs. I'm imagining most of these are very basic ICs, more like um, sort of uh, packages of transistors or logic gates or something like that. They're not going to be enormously complicated microprocessors or anything. I mean most of them are more like DIP16 packages. They're tiny. Oh look, there's a DIP8. Head servo. <laughs> no doubt what that one does. So up here, this cable has got a little sticker on it that says A1. And of course, on the board, we have a little label that says A1. Haven't seen something that nice since the Dyson vacuum cleaner? I think they were the last time we saw that. Oh, uh, the LCD projector, I think, labelled all its cables and connectors as well, didn't it? So hopefully... Oh, that's not good. It's all fun and games until a sticker falls off. On the side here, there is actually a pair of 
what I'll assume for now is MOSFETs. And they're just on these little fly leads and tiny little daughter boards, just so they can be attached to this big piece of aluminium for heat dissipation. So that full assembly, just to bolt these tiny little MOSFETs to that aluminium plate, was an assembly of a nut, a bolt, three washers, and a tiny little bit of insulation wrapped around the, the, uh, the nut as well, the bolt. That's crazy. Wow. There is a silk screen on this side of the board showing the traces on the other side of the board. One and L6. I've not actually found the power management here yet. Where does the power comes in down there somewhere? So presumably at some point we're going to find a whacking great transformer. That would explain a good chunk of the weight. I can't can't picture this having an inbuilt switch mode power supply. I think that'd be far too noisy for the video signals, probably. Oh, that horrible thing of, I want to bend it far enough to get it out, but if I bend it too far and I break it, pretty much irreplaceable at this point. Fantastic design, so that once this board's up at 45 degrees, you can either latch it in place or slide it out completely. And that is some clever, clever stuff. Even the cable management here is non-destructive. So that is the video processing board. Again, it's just, it's got this silk screen all over it of what the, I'm assuming the underside looks like. So under here, we've got another couple of modules. Uh, I think these are associated with the tuner, by the looks of things and a couple of extra slots which aren't populated in my model. Um, got another one here and this one which actually lines up with a couple of uh, blank plates on the back which make me think that that one was probably, I mean three holes on the back of this, it's got to be left, right and composite. That would make sense to me. FM demodulator. Oh okay, so this is a modulator demodulator card. So this is receiving the antenna signal, demodulating it to a video signal so it can be recorded on tape, as well as modulating the off video signal going out to the antenna so a TV can be tuned into it. Quality of these components. Still, I guess you'd expect that when it costs about the same as a car could. Well, actually, no, that's an exaggeration, but still not cheap. Whoa. There's your transformer. I would think a significant chunk of weight comes from that and that alone. And you see these big circles with C104, C103, C107. They're gonna be some large capacitors, aren't they? And based on what we've seen so far, hopefully still in good condition capacitors. Really don't wanna to have to be recapping a massive board as well. That power board is hinged. You seriously do not see stuff like this anymore. Just amazing. Here is the main reason why I think this unit doesn't work. Something previously posing as rubber belts. Although that one actually still is quite rubbery. Uh, I've got the front towards me. So that's gonna be the flywheel for the tape feed, the tape spooling. And that is gonna be the flywheel uh, for the reed head, the reed right head. Huge amount of mass behind that. I guess you want that to keep it con constant rate. Right, I'm going to have to resort to a torch. Uh, okay. <laughs> Crafty old devils. There's a screw behind the record button. Credit where credit's due. That is a very good idea for hiding screws. Okay, so a handful more connectors. What was this board? Timer circuit. You've got the tuning tray, which pops out the front like this. And you can see the, they are on long leads to be able to give it that flexibility, that movement. And then you've got your channel selection. Okay, so the connector for the clock has only got one, two, three, four, five pins. Now, obviously you're gonna get ground and power, what do you think the other three are? Because there's no reason for the rest of the machine to have a clock. It couldn't automatically set its time. You had to set the time. So what were the other three pins? I can kind of believe that there was a pair that said record now. Maybe it's ground and power, and they've got a separate ground because it was coming from a different reference voltage for, or a different part of the transformer or power supply. Maybe it was ground start and stop recording. 
such complex mechanical linkages going on here that I can't even work out how that's supposed to be fired. So, as we insert the tape in here, head flips open and exposes the tape. Ooh. Okay. Can you see three sets of teeth down here spin with that bottom drum? Three sets of teeth up here spin separately. So the white teeth and the black teeth on this tape are actually separate parts of the mechanism. So this is a, it's not like an eight track, which is a continuous spool onto where it comes off the center and then rewinds around the outside of a single drum. This is spooling on a double deck. And actually that makes complete sense. When you look at the shape of this, it comes off the bottom onto the top. So there's gonna be two spools counter rotating, double stacked in this, in this mechanism. That makes absolute sense now. Okay, this, this motor here. <laughs> I've just realized. Look at the position of this pin over here. I bet when this is supposed to be loading, that should be here, ready to accept the tape and pull it round. And the fact that it's all the way over here makes me think that this stopped working with a tape in it. Because I'm sure part of the eject operation is gonna to be to return that before it releases. That's better. Right, that's the load position. So if I now insert this tape, it is much happier to be clear of the um, of the read write drum, which it was slightly fouling before, sits there, and then the whole mechanism, I'm doing this very gently because I don't want to damage the tape, spins round, feeding tape all the way around and slightly moving that head into place. Okay, so back on the underside, we know that's gonna be the read write head because it's got that ever so slight chamfer on it and it's probably fed from that motor there which feels very stiff. But I want to get these brushes out because that makes no sense to me. They feel like actual bristle. They're certainly decomposing like it. They can't... Have they really included brushes just to clean the belts? Okay, for a teardown, I appreciate this is not as torn down as I normally go, but this is where I'm going to call it for today. First of all, because I've already been poking around this thing for hours and this is as far as I've got. Uh, second of all, it's because this is something which I have slightly fallen in love with and I'm going to make it my personal project to try and repair this to working order. I have, quite rare, two tapes with recordings on them, so I can check whether I get this working or not. Hopefully, once we've done replacement belts, which are a range of stretched to disintegrated, it should be reasonably straightforward to be able to probe this, plug this in, make sure it works. Hopefully we're not gonna let any magic smoke out, but I'm gonna keep a, a log and a record of what I'm doing to get this working again over on the Element 14 community. It's, it's not a, an E14 Presents video, it's just something I'm gonna do as a labor of love. And I really hope that you are interested enough in this as it is to follow along and see if I can get this working. Um, if anybody has experience working with the N1700 or the N1702 or indeed the N1500, help me out. I might well need it. <laughs> this is like my sweet spot for where I think electronics is the coolest because the stuff you're doing here is just phenomenal, but it's before we go to uh, really heavy integrated circuits. Uh, Pong a chip was just after this. Everything condensed down to a single chip and it got kind of, well, here's a data sheet, it does it. It got a little bit boring, but this, I'm, I'm pretty sure you could follow line by line exactly what every one of these components does. There is no magic box that makes it work. It is wonderful. I hope you're as excited about this as I am, and hopefully you'll follow my, uh, my repair log over on the Element 14 community. Thank you so much for watching this opening gambit. I'll see you over there for the repair.